How's everybody doing? Blessed and highly favored. That's kind of been my, uh, my theme. When people ask me what I'm doing, I always say, blessed and highly favored. We were at uh, Olive Garden the other night, me and Daryl having dinner. And a guy sitting next to us was just kept looking at us, and he said, how y'all doing? And I said, blessed and highly favored. And that just was a snowball of conversation about the Lord and his blessings. And so, I don't know. To me, that's, uh, that's important because I feel like I am blessed. And I feel like I am highly favored. And if you can't get here on time, Jonathan, just get here when you can. <laughs> I got to give you my hard time. I'm not recording yet. So let's pray. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for everything that is good and holy and perfect in our lives. Lord, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy and your grace. Father, we thank you that you fill us with the Holy Spirit, that you give us the ability to get knowledge and wisdom. Thank you for putting it into our hearts, the desire to learn, to read, to study, and pray. Because I know when we read your word, that's what transforms our lives. It's not nothing anybody else says, but it is the word of God. And I thank you, Lord, that everybody's in here, that they come to listen and learn. And I pray that as I do study, Lord, that you give me new insights and new, new things to talk about, Lord, to keep things exciting, Father. Because I'd be the first to tell you, Lord, I don't like a boring preacher. And so let's try to keep this relevant. Let's try to keep it exciting. And uh, I thank you, Lord, for, for your anointing. <clears throat> and uh, thank you for anointing everybody in here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're on part two of our Genesis series. And I've really been trying to crack the whip on myself and just really dig deeper and deeper and deeper. But sometimes I think, because of my nature, that I get too deep. And when you start getting so deep, you start getting kind of off the target. So I had to kind of scale back a little bit and just kind of keep it uh, not surface level, but just enough that when we revisit this next year, then we can add on to what we've already talked about. Um, so last week, uh, real quick, also remember, keep your questions until the very end. If you've got any questions or comments, please speak in the microphone. Daryl Bailey's got the mic. And he'll get it to you fast. And the reason for that is because it'll pick up on the sound system. And I'm not standing in the video looking like I'm doing nothing while you're asking a question because you can't hear it otherwise. So I appreciate y'all doing that. And uh, we're going to do just a quick overview from last week. So last week we, we talked about the authorship of the first five books of the Bible. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if you've done any kind of uh, even basic study from Genesis to Revelation, you can see all through the Bible where the Spirit of God or angels or somebody spoke to somebody and gave them some wisdom and gave them some knowledge, whether it was God, the Holy Spirit, whether it was angels, or even if it was Jesus. Sometimes it was a donkey. <laughs> yeah, and but... The Holy Spirit is what inspired uh, Moses to write. And one of the questions I asked was, how could Moses write Genesis when he wasn't even born until Exodus? So, but it was all inspired by the Holy Spirit. And there's been a lot of controversy about that. And look, I'm just going to tell you, you know, the Bible's true and true. If you think you found a contradiction, let's bring it, let's study about it, and let's pray about it. Because I can assure you, God's word is not contradictory. Just because it seems like it on the surface. We've had men and women over the years that translate things and translate words, and we're going to talk about one of them in the book of Acts. And it gives it a whole different meaning of what the scripture means when you get the original meaning of what it is in Greek and Hebrew. And that's why it's, I'm not asking you to learn Greek and Hebrew, but I'm just saying it does have a whole different meaning. But it was written, the, the Genesis was written to Israel. You know, Israel was... Uh, used to be Jacob. We talk, we're going to talk about name changes. There's something significant about his, his name being changed. Um, Abram becoming Abraham. Sarai becoming Sarah. Uh, Paul, Saul becoming Paul. Uh, Caiaphas, uh, what was it? Uh, Cephas becoming Peter, you know, the rock. So there's something significant about name changes. And we're going to really get into that here um, when we get to that portion of Genesis. But, you know, Jacob became Israel. Israel became the 12 tribes of Israel. So normally now when you hear the Bible referring to Israel, somebody referring to Israel, it's one of the 12 sons usually. 
of the 12 tribes. And, but it was also written to all of us as believers. Because remember, as believers in the New Testament, we were adopted. We were grafted in as Gentiles. Because remember, Paul went out to the Gentiles. Peter went to the Jews. And we talked about the two different ways that they were both presenting the gospel. Peter presented to a, a generation of people that had a foundation. 3,500 people got saved. Paul presented it to the Gentiles who had many gods, didn't know the true God, and none of them got saved, you know? And, but yeah, so Genesis was written to all of us. And the purpose was to preserve the historical and theological record of creation, sin, and redemption. And we talked about Jesus and pointed out where he is and, and where he was mentioned. We talked about the Trinity, the evidence of the Trinity, which I think is very important. Um, just another side note. People say they don't believe in the Trinity because it's not written in the Bible. But I got a news flash for you. The word Bible isn't in the Bible, but we believe it. Dinosaurs not in the Bible. Rapture's not in the Bible. There's a lot of things that's not in the Bible that we believe, but there's evidence for all of it. And I'm not sure if this is what the Bible actually stands for, but I had a kid tell me one time it stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. And I'm okay with that. And I close with, if you cannot accept the first verse, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, then you can't accept any of it. If you can't accept the fact that God makes a declaration, he doesn't try to convince you that he is God. He's not trying to lay out this plan so you can see, oh, well, if he, if he did all this, maybe he is God. No, he comes straight on, first thing, first horse rattle out of the box and says, in the beginning, God, he makes a declaration saying that I am that I am. And the first in Hebrew, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's seven words in Hebrew. And remember, seven is a number for completion. So when he created it, he ended it at the same time. And that really gets deep into predestination. I kind of understand it, but I'm not going to tell you about it because it gets me confusing. But it is a good study. Um, so, but if you can't accept the first verse that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, you can't accept the remainder of the Bible either. Because everything's hinged on creation. Um, the first verse is the doorway to the word of God. People who think they can explain creation apart from the scriptures should consider the statement that was made by the Lord to Job. Remember in Job 38, 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have an understanding. So the creation account has to be accepted by faith. How many of you believe creation the way God created it? By faith, that God created the earth. And we're going to get to the idea where some say, uh, oh, did God, it took him 7,000 years to create. And, oh, some say it took him seven days to create. I'm going to tell you, it was seven days. It was not 7,000 years. And they take that scripture that God says that a day is to, unto the Lord is a 1,000 years and try to tie it into creation and make it look like it took God 7,000 years to create what we have. Well, that's not true. And I'm going to take you and show you probably more scriptures than you want to read on that, specifically when it talks about creation for that point. But if you have any, uh, there's a guy that I've been following, and I, pretty much I agree with just about everything he's ever talked about, except for his position on speaking in tongues. I don't know, I, I feel like he missed it. I feel like he just, he's way off. But everything else about, he's a scientist, his name is Kent Hovind. And if you get a chance to look him up on YouTube, he has this brilliant, amazing mind as a scientist to show you things that will blow your mind on how God created the heavens and the earth. And it's amazing. And he's a super awesome guy. And you take what, uh, the nuggets you can take, put them in your pocket. If it doesn't fit for you, throw it out. So if you get a chance, it's Kent Hovind. Super, uh, super knowledgeable. And he's a scientist who became a Christian. And he talks about dinosaurs. It's a, he's an, an amazing guy. But Genesis 1 2 says, The earth was without uh, form. Uh, let me read it. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It was without form. And he says he was without, it was without void. And it says darkness was on the face of the earth. So what he's saying is the planet was formless, there was nothing in the planet. It had no shape. There was nothing there. It was empty. There was darkness. It was formless. And it means there was nothing to fill it. There was no dirt there. There was no trees. There was no rocks. 
laying around. There was no water. You know what I mean? There was absolutely nothing there. It, it didn't have any features, so you couldn't identify one thing from another thing. So when God created something out of nothing, but also, also to disprove the evolution theory or that we came from pond scum or that we came from microbiological algae sitting on a rock for millions of years, to, to disprove that um, without life, without form and void also means without life, which means there was nothing living. So if there was nothing living, that means there was no algae, right? That means there was no tadpoles that we could evolve from. That means that there was no pond scum. That means there was no microorganisms, so, and there was nothing there. And just a little side note on evolution and how, how all that is being crammed down our children's throats. One, one thing I want you to pay attention to, and it's a good question to ask, when people try to talk to you about it, is we have millions and millions and millions of evidence of monkeys, and we have millions and millions and millions of evidence of humans, but not one shred of evidence of the in-between. Does that make sense? There's no evidence. And I know they're going to try to say, oh, well, we got Lucy. Well, no, we don't got Lucy. Lucy was proven that she had a pig jawbone and it was, a, a, I think, a camel toe bone. And they were found a mile and a half apart, three years apart. And that's what they chose to decide to say that we have evidence of, of evolution. It helps to do your research. It helps to read, uh, not just secular, but also uh, not just Christian literature, but also secular. So you get an idea of what they're saying. Am I making sense? You, see, you follow what I'm saying? And the reason for that... And I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to move on. The reason that they found Lucy, because it was at the end of this, I think, six or seven year place where these people had all this money to do all this research to prove evolution, and they were up for refunding, and either you find something or your funding's cut off. So guess what they found? They found Lucy. Not really. They didn't find Lucy. There's no evidence of Lucy. There's no evidence of anything evolving from anything to something else. No scientific evidence. If there was, I promise you, things would be different. And the reason there was nothing, why do you think there was nothing when the earth was without form and void? The reason there was nothing was because God hadn't created nothing yet. He hadn't done anything yet. And just like in Genesis 1-2, Many times we're empty. Many times we're without and we're void because oftentimes our lives are filled with other things besides God. And what I want you to see is the silent inference here that until God entered this void, there was no life. There was no life until God entered this void. And it wasn't until after the Holy Spirit came and was hovering over the face of the deep, then the light was created in verse 3. And it said, the light brings life. And this is so true for us, and I want you to see the correlation here is that we are also void and we're also lost in darkness without God living inside of us. We're, we're without form. We were void. We're empty. We're full of darkness in the same way, the same way as, as creation. Now, there's others who also believe that without form and void and darkness because of Satan's revolt when he fell from heaven. I researched that quite a bit. Because I thought, I had originally thought the angels weren't created until creation, until God started creating things. But they were there before creation. And one of the questions I was going to ask you is when were the angels created? And it, it, I'm going to tell you right here. In Job 38, verses 4 through 7. Job 38, verses 4 through 7. It says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know who stretched out a measuring line across it. On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? And this is what I want you to see. While, verse 7, while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. So they sang, the morning stars sang together. I'm going to talk about the morning stars. They're not stars. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the morning stars. And all the angels shouted for joy at God's creation. So that means they had to have been there before God created the heavens and the earth. Does that make sense? Okay. 
I believe they were created before God created the heaven and the, and the earth. Now, the two, the two, the two uh, morning stars, oftentimes when you read that, and if you just read right past it and you're not paying attention, you're going to think it was a bright star sitting up in the sky. But I want you to understand that Isaiah 14, 12 says, How you are fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. So they're calling Satan, Lucifer, a morning star. Also, Revelation 22, 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. So the Bible's calling both Satan and Jesus the bright and uh, morning stars. And I've heard people say, and there's literature out there, if you lurk, look hard enough, who try to tie in Jesus Christ as being Lucifer because of these two verses. You've got to do your research. That's not true. That is absolutely not true. Do angels have the ability to make choice? That's one of the, the questions that I've been in discussion with many people for, for a long time. So many people think angels are robots and they don't get to make decisions and they don't, aren't able to make choices. But Satan made a choice to revolt against God. He made a decision. So if you're making a decision, that means you have choice. So my answer to that is absolutely. Absolutely. Angels have choice. Matter of fact, not only was late, uh, Satan cast down from heaven, Lucifer, but who was the, the prettiest angel ever created. See, he's very cunning. He's very deceiving. Literature and, and uh, artists throughout the year, because of the evil of Satan and the evil of Lucifer, always have the connotation and, and picture painted as this gruesome-looking, fork-eared guy. <laughs> And so when we think about Satan, that's what we think about. But remember, he presents himself as an angel of light. So when he comes to you, he's not going to look ugly. He's not going to look disgusting. He's going to come to you in a way that every desire that you've ever want is going to be right there in front of you. And if he's so cunning and so deceiving that he took one-third of the heavenly host with him, these are people that walked with God Almighty. These were people that was in the presence, the Shekinah glory, not people, angels, in the, in the glory of the Lord, and yet they were still deceived. So how much more can he deceive us? How much more can he deceive us in our desires and our wants when we're barely Christians? And I, I, I say that boldly because we, we've straddled the fence. We, we want a little bit of this and we want a little bit of that. You know, it's like Burger King. You, you know, you're not going to get it your way. It's God's way. <laughs> I mean, that's just the truth. But he's going to present himself as an angel of light. But when Jesus comes into your heart, well, let me back up. When God created the world, he eliminated the darkness. That's, I want you to pay attention to that. When he created it, he eliminated the darkness. And also pay attention that he created the heaven, the earth first before he created the stars and the moon and the sun and everything else. So everything God created was centered here for us. From the beginning of time, the foundations of the earth, he had us in his mind that he was going to create it. And then everything came out from the earth. It's almost like this is the center. Like it's the nucleus. It's the hub. So what about aliens? Well, Y'all are looking at me. Let's talk about something interesting for one second. How many of y'all believe in aliens? I just raised my hand to see if y'all would. How many of you really, honestly, you don't have to raise your hand, believe in extraterrestrial? I, I will t stand here and tell you I do not. I believe in angelic beings. I believe there's uh, spiritual warfare that happens in the heavenly realms. But I also believe that the idea of aliens was created by Lucifer, by Satan. And let me tell you why. When Jesus comes, when that, when that trump sounds and the, horn, and the sky in the east parts and all the Christians who have confessed Christ and are living for him and walking and expecting him to return, when we're all taken up in the rapture, who do you think they're going to blame for this? Are they going to say it was Jesus? No. 
They're going to stay with the aliens. You got to remember, Satan's patient. He's very patient. I said it before and I said it, uh, and I'll say it again. You can't read one scripture a day and think you're going to fight against the enemy of Satan who never sleeps. His sole mission and purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And right now, he's trying to steal our salvation. He's trying to steal our hope. He's trying to steal our children and our finances. But we have an advent, we have an overcomer. Because the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I want to tell y'all, to, to, I'm going to ask y'all, as, as my church family, to quit telling people that God will not give you more than you can bear. That he gives the strongest battles to the strongest people, because that's not biblical. The Bible says God will not tempt you beyond what you can physically handle. It says nothing about giving you battles. He's going to give you the hardest battles, I believe, as Christians. Because everything we do is going to be refined by fire. And when we come out of the fire, just like the three Hebrews, and Nebuchadnezzar standing there and said, hey, we threw three boys in, and there's one that looks like the Son of God. Hmm, Jesus in the fiery furnace. And when they came out, what was burned off of them? The ropes that had them shackled. So we got to be careful what we tell people, because we give them this false sense that if you tell people that God only gives the strongest battles to the strongest people, then maybe they're going to say, well, I don't want to be strong anymore. Maybe I'm tired of these battles. But what, and what we do inevitably is we make people think that they're doing this in their own strength when we tell them that. Say, no, we all have the same battles. We're just fighting on a different playing field. But when God created the world, he eliminated the darkness. He created order. Order. God is a God of order. That's why Sunday when I, uh, I felt the Holy Spirit move and I got up and I said, hey, uh, we're going to pray in tongues. We're going to have corporate worship in tongues. And I could see some faces. People didn't understand it. But they didn't leave. And the atmosphere changed. Because God is the God of, an, of an order. And the way things were allowed to be in the past, we had to get it in order. And it had to be some control over that. And so now I feel the Holy Spirit just flowing and moving. And that people are free to worship from where we were before. But he created order. He filled the empty void. And when Jesus comes into your heart, church, he eliminates the darkness that's in your heart. He eliminates the darkness that's in your soul. He eliminates the, uh, he, created, or, he creates order in your life that only he can bring. And he fills that empty void. I know in my life, for, for many years, I tried to fill an, a void in my heart that was only meant to be filled by a Savior. I tried to fill it with other things, everything, Sex, drugs, rock and roll, drinking. I tried to fill it with everything but God Almighty. And guess what? Now that he's filled that void, he takes care of everything that only he could do. And one thing on which all believers can agree is that God created the foundations of the earth upon which all creation occurred. Hebrews 1.10 says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. So every time I see a beautiful sunset, I think, Lord, you painted that for me. You painted that for me to look at, so I could try to put it on the canvas. <laughs> Verse 2 says, continued. Um, let me read it one more time. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Why was the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters? Have you ever thought about asking yourself that question? Why was the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters? The Holy Spirit is the agent of creation. The Holy Spirit is the agent of creation. In the account of creation, at the very beginning of the Bible, we're told that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? The Hebrew word translated as spirit uh, here is called ruach. How many of you heard that term before? Ruach. Uh, it, it, would, uh, it, could also be, it could also mean breath. Uh, ruach Elohim. The breath of the Almighty. That's what was hovering over the face of the waters. It's, it's the agent of creation. And it's not the immateriality of the spirit that is in the view here, but rather power and energy that's on display. 
during the week of creation, God put a lot of things on display that only he could do. He put all of his power on display. He put all of his majesty on display. He put all of the splendor that he has and all of his wisdom and all of his knowledge. He put all that on full display for all of us. The picture is of God's energy breathing. God breathed. He breathed. We, if we can get a hold of the breath, the Ruach, the El- Ruach Elohim of God, how he breathed the breath of life into everything that he did um, in creation or speaking the world into existence. E- even to putting the stars in the place, he said, you're going to go here and you're going to go here and you're going to go here. And I had somebody tell me when I was speaking about sin one time and when you get to heaven, you're going to give an account for everything, every idle word, every idle deed that you ever did, both good and bad. And somebody said, well, that's going to take forever. And I just went, well, and I've also been telling people when I get to heaven, I'm going to sleep for a thousand years, so peace out. <laughs> See you when I get back. But we read in Isaiah, verses 40, 26, the question is asked, who created these? And we have the answer right here in Genesis 1-2. The Spirit is the irresistible power by which God accomplishes His purpose. How many of you ever had something inside you say, don't do that? How many of you are like me and you you hear that gut feeling, don't do that, but then your manliness takes over or your fleshliness takes over? Say, I can do that. (laughs) I can do that. This is the first recorded ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now there was water under the expanse, the oceans, and there was also water surrounding the earth above the expanse. And we're going to talk about that when we get to dinosaurs, how dinosaurs were able to live as long as they did, how humans were able to live before the flood because of the waters that surrounded the earth. And that's going to be exciting to talk about. And I almost want to jump ahead, but I don't want to get off target here. I want to keep you all coming back. What's interesting here is that In each of the creative acts of God, that God speaks of what is not until it is. He speaks of what was not until it is. This is the opposite of our human nature, though. Usually we speak only of what is, and we don't normally speak of what is not as though it is. And so I pulled up the scripture, Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations before him who believed, even God who quickened the dead, and called those things which be not as though they were. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, that doesn't mean that that applies to us. I'm going to tell you it does. It does apply to us. 2 Timothy three sixteen. all scripture is God-breathed. The Ruach, the Elohim, God breathed it. Just like when he changed Abraham to Abraham, Abraham, he breathed the anointing. You follow what I'm saying? All scripture is God breathed. So that means, do we think the Old Testament is scripture? Yes, that means it's good. And what is it good for? Correction, reproof, instruction, and how we need to live our life. So when God says in the Old Testament, Things like, you know, calling those things that be not as though they are, that tells me that I can call things that be not as though they are. That tells me that when I can get up in the morning, I can call the sickness I got healed in the name of Jesus. Or I can see somebody that has cancer and say, I mean, that's what we're doing when we pray, right? Whether you want to call it scripture or not, when you pray for somebody to be healed, you're saying in Jesus' name, I'm calling what's not here to be what is over here. I get tired of people arguing these things. It's so simple. If they they would just take a moment and pray and ask the Holy Spirit, show me what I need to know, this whole world would be a better place. But when you get your theology and your doctrine on Facebook 101, come on, church, give me a break. The first day of creation, God creates light. Verses 3 through 5. Then God said, let there be light and let there be light. And And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Each of God's um, 
Each act of creation was accomplished by the creative word of God. He has a creative mind. He is the ultimate engineer. He is the ultimate architect. He never misses a detail. All the way from the petals of a flower, the blades of grass, to the molecules that make up the human anatomy. God is the ultimate architect. And sometimes we get this idea that he doesn't care that I don't have enough gas money to get to work next week. And sometimes we get this idea that our little pity problems that God don't want to hear about. But he says, no, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Cast all your cares upon me. It doesn't matter how big or how small. He created this universe and this space and this earth, the sun, the moon, the stars. He created all of that with his breath. Could you imagine what he would do if he put tools in his hands? Come on, church. That's power. That's majesty. That's splendor. He uttered his word, and it was accomplished. He said, let it be so, and it happened. And the interesting thing that he says is his word will never return void. So if it goes out, it's going to come back. It's going to come back full of what it went out, set out to do, which is bring life and to make life. Psalms 33, uh, 6 through 9. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth, the breath of God. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And that theme, that speaking, that God speaking and the Holy Spirit speaking or the angels speaking is common from Genesis to Revelation. And if you read it, do, do a word search, word study on, the, on, on word or speak or talk or angel or Jesus and just get, or spirit. And you'll be amazed at how many instances God showed up and spoke to somebody. Matter of fact, I would say that God talks so much that we don't even get a chance to speak. I would, I would go as far as to say he started talking and he never shut up. That's who our God is. He wants a relationship with us. He speaks, and we're supposed to listen. But oftentimes we can't hear what God is trying to tell us because we're trying to tell him that i got to have this new car. i got to have this new house. i got to have this new girl. i got to have these new Jordans. Whatever you're asking God for, you, you keep noise, chaos going in your head, and you can't hear. Sometimes you got to shut it off. Shut it out. Put earplugs in your ear. Many a nights I tell Sarah and Matthew, go in your room. And if you've ever spent any time at my house, you know I don't like noise. You know I don't like chaos. The volume on my television never gets over seven. I'm not exaggerating. If you want to hear the TV, guess what you got to do? Zip it. I'm not talking over you. Just a little side note. If you come to my house think you're going to jam up on some TV. <laughs> I don't play. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And there are those people who say that does not mean what we think it means. There are people that say that you can't speak things into existence. And I'm going to tell you, you can speak things into existence. And if you're, if you're watching online, I'm telling you there's power in, the, in your tongue, and you can create life with your tongue. And if you don't believe me, if, how many of you have more than one kid? I want you to do, do something for six weeks. I want you to tell one kid they're sorry, you can't ever do nothing right every single day, and then tell the other one how awesome they are. And then in six weeks, I want you to see the difference. Don't really do that. I'm giving you an example. There's power in your tongues. You have the power to build life, to encourage, to build up. And God, not only did God have power in his words, but he gave us power in our words to speak life. When you wake up in the morning, you say, I am the righteousness of Christ. I am redeemed. I am born again. God spoke life and created the world. He's speaking life in me, and I'm going to speak life into myself. I'm going to speak life into my kids. I'm going to speak life into my job. If you don't like your circumstances, start speaking life into it. 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, you reap what you sow. And that's another common theme from the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. You reap what you sow. If you wake up every morning and you got something negative to say to your wife, guess what? Guess what you're not going to get on Friday? Guess what's going to happen? She's going to shut you down. She's going to quit communicating with you. But if you wake up every morning and you praise your wife, lift her up, build her up, and you do the same for your husband, and you work on your marriage, you you compliment each other, you praise each other, but more importantly, you pray together, guess how amazing your marriage is going to be? I don't want to be with anybody that I can't pray with every day. That ain't my style. I was never a guy that liked to pray. But once I understood, once my pastor Paul Golden taught me about prayer and it being the, the, one of the most biggest unused resources and I started praying and I started seeing results, you can't get me to stop praying. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I love to pray. And I thank God for Bluetooth. Now I don't look like an idiot talking to myself driving down the road. People think I'm talking on the Bluetooth. The word of God is what enables man to be made into a new creature as well. 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides in us forever. Skip down to verse 25, it says, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And I'm going to read this one, and then I'm going to talk about something, and then we're going to close this out. John chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless, and he's talking to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And be born, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this ties in with the word of God what, that enables man to be made into a new creation, a new creature. And that's why we're talking about this. And my favorite scripture, my life scripture, 2 Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, all things become new. So I want to talk about baptism for a minute before we get to Genesis chapter 6 because it's important moving forward. So what we do know is that baptism does not save you. How many of you have ever thought that baptism saves you? There are certain churches, certain sects of religion that teach works righteousness that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. And that's not true. You can go go down a dry center and come up a wet center. Baptism doesn't save you does not save you. And if baptism saves you, then why, why did Jesus, or if baptism does not save you, rather, why did Jesus tell Nicodemus the only way to enter the kingdom of God was to be born of water and the Spirit? He told Nicodemus, you have to be baptized of water and the Spirit, but yet he told the thief on the cross who wasn't baptized today, you will see me in paradise. But then Peter said, um, as this was after this Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter 2, and they got filled with the Holy Spirit with cloven tongues of fire, and they went out and they preached the gospel. And the men were cut to their heart. And they said, What, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter stands up and says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And, and when you read that, you say, okay, you got to repent, and then you be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's what Peter said. So it's confusing. Doesn't that kind of make you think that you have to be baptized to have your sins forgiven? And then Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what about the people in the Old Testament who died and weren't baptized? What about the people in the Old Testament who died and weren't baptized? Sounds like a big mess. Hang on, Bob, at the end, please. Sounds like a big mess, right? Let me clean this mess up. I purposely created this. I purposely tried to confuse you so you could think, well, does baptism save you or not? Are you confused? If you're confused, then I did my job. Because it's confusing, right? 
Let's start with John the Baptist. John was the baptism of repentance, right? Matthew 3, 1 through 6. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. And John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out, people went out to him from, from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, confessing, speaking. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So when Jesus told Nicodemus that he had to be born of water and of the Spirit, he, what he was telling him was John's baptism. And why was he talking about John's baptism? Because the Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. The Holy Spirit didn't fall into the Acts chapter 2, the Comforter. Remember, he tells them, y'all wait for me. Wait in Jerusalem till the Comforter comes. When he was telling Nicodemus this, he was talking about the baptism of John. Baptism doesn't save you. He was telling him to repent. So in other words, he told Nicodemus that he needed to repent and turn to him so he can be regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, 38. Peter kind of said the same thing. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. But I thought baptism doesn't save you. It does. The word, listen to me closely. I'm going to clean it up. The word F-O-R, for, in Acts 2.38, that says repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins should have actually been translated repent and be baptized because of the remission of your sins. If you translate it back to the Greek and the Hebrew, you'll understand that's, that's what it really means. So in other words, baptism doesn't save you. But there's entire people, religions, who've based works righteousness on getting baptized to be saved, getting baptized to have your sins re removed, and to be washed clean. And I asked them one time, so what happens when you sin? Do you get rebaptized? Oh, we don't sin anymore. I said, brother, let me talk to you. And that's been a, an ongoing discussion for about three years. It doesn't matter the evidence that you present. If people don't want to believe, they're just not going to believe. But Acts 2.38 should actually be read as repent and be baptized because of the remission of your sins. So what about the Old Testament? What about the Old Testament? Because you remember, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Why is he going to require us to be baptized but not all the patriarchs that went before us? Well, he did, because they were. Genesis verse 2 is the first place that we see the Spirit and the water together. It's kind of like Jesus was telling Nicodemus. And in, in Genesis chapter 7, Noah came through what? The flood. He came through the water. That's a type and shadow, symbolic for baptism. So they were baptized. Eight people, Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons and their three wives. Eight people came out of the ark. And it's amazing that God destroyed the earth and killed everything off except the big sea creatures. And we'll talk about that. To start new life. But he did it knowing, he did it knowing that these eight people carried with them not just the newness of what life was going to bring, but also the sinful nature of the flesh. We overlooked that. We think God abolished sin. He didn't. He abolished the bad. Sin is still in the flesh. Sin was still in the nature of mankind. And how do we know that? Because as soon as Noah got off the boat, he got drunk and exposed himself to his kids. Sin came through the flood. Moses, mother, put him in a tiny basket and shoved him down the Nile River, down the stream. Pharaoh's daughter drew him out of the water. And Moses' name literally means drawn out, to be drawn out. He was drawn out by Pharaoh's daughter, that was type, a type of a baptism. Um, when God parted the Red Sea for the Israelites and they went across on dry land, they went through the water. That was a type and shadow of baptism. See, baptism is common. And when, when Joshua got ready to take the Israelites to the promised land, what did they do? What did the, the uh, priests do? They stepped in the Jordan River. And guess what happened? The water parted. So guess what? They were all what? Baptized. Type and shadow of baptism. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism, what it means now for us, is that I now identify with the death, 
the burial, and the resurrection of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what it says to the people who are watching is, hey, I'm going to live a higher standard. I'm going to live for Jesus, and I want you to hold me accountable. If baptism could save you, then we should believe in works righteousness. If baptism saves you, then we could say if you give the most money, you can get into heaven. See, we're saved by grace, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. I've been baptized a lot of times. And the other day I got so mad that I had to get re-saved three times. <laughs> I was hot. <laughs> I'm going to end right there. Guys, i got way more to talk about, but we'll pick it up next week. So uh, real quick, Daryl, uh, do we have any questions about what we talked about so far? Just raise your hand and grab the mic. And... I'd just like to say something that Dr. J. Vernon McGee teaches, and it really makes sense when you read these two scriptures. Uh, you know, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born, and if you look that original wording up, it is birthed, like a natural childbirth, uh, born of water. Well, what happens when a mother has a baby? The water breaks, the baby comes out, you have a natural baby. And then he talks about being a spiritual baby uh, in the next verse. Well, let me just read it all together so it makes sense. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he confirms this natural childbirth by saying in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, uh, and that which is born of the Spirit, or being born again, is spirit. So it's natural childbirth and spiritual rebirth is what J. Vernon McGee teaches, and it kind of makes sense. Yes. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, you were talking about that Noah and his family members got on the ark, and that was kind of like their way of baptism. Mm -hmm. Well, the flooding of the earth, the 40 days and 40 mm -hmm. night, you know, I mean, it's pretty much washing everything away. Yes. Is that a type of baptism, maybe? It is. That was the whole... The, the whole point was... Yeah, so you remember up to that point, and we'll, we're really going to dive deep in, in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. But up until that point, they, God told Noah to build an ark to save them from something nobody had ever seen. It had never rained. It only misted from the ground. So not only did it start raining, but the Bible says the fountains of the deep broke loose. And all this water came forth. So everything that had breath was destroyed except for the ones that were in the ark. Now there's theories, again, when we, talk, when we talked about, and we'll talk about it again, Cain, when he went to the land of Nod, Met his wife. You know, I kind of briefly explained that. There's theories that God had another set of humans that were saved in another ark during the flood, and they survived. So there's actually two races of people. I'm telling you, it's hogwash. It's not true. But I will tell you one thing that is true. Whether, no matter what country you go to, what religion you believe in, just about every culture in the world from the beginning of time all have a great flood story. And they all have a great flood story about one boat that was saved and either eight people or some people and a few animals. So we know, uh, and scientifically, let me say this real quick, scientifically, we, everybody looks at science like, oh, they're evil. They're trying to disprove the Bible. Listen to what they're saying to some degree because what they're actually doing now is they're proving everything that they said was wrong. God causes the... Wise things, the dumb things of the world to confound the wise or something. Do you see what I'm saying? So yes, that was a type of baptism for the people that got, uh, was on the ark. The ones that were, yes, and, and to add on to that, the ones that weren't on the ark were baptized unto death. In a sense, if you want to look at it that way. Because they weren't saved. They didn't believe in God. They mocked Noah for 120 years. I could only imagine... If any one of them would have truly repented to God. And we knew and sacrifice, you know, we're going to talk about sacrificial worship. Where did that come from? It just says it happened. How did it happen? When Cain and Abel brought their offerings to the Lord. It doesn't say that they were instructed to do that. That was something that was instilled in them in the garden. So yes, the people that died, you, if you want to look at it like a baptism, you can. But it wasn't baptized into life. It was baptized into death. Any other questions? 
Tim, it's not really a question, but I believe that these scientific things that just prove the Bible over and over again are really neat. But I believe we need to be careful and understand that we shouldn't depend on science to prove the Word of God because it says that we should re accept the Word of God with childlike faith. If you're depending on science to prove the Word of God, you're going to be disappointed because they, they can't prove everything. Yeah. And we, we have to accept that, you know, it, it's just like we, we have to accept that God is God, that he's the creator, and that Jesus Christ is our Lord, whom we've never seen. We accept him by faith, you know, and I just wanted to share that because I, there, there's all kind of sects that get started, like Scientology, you know, where if it's not can't be proven scientifically, then they don't believe it at all. And, and people just get off on all kind of weird tangents. Yes, sir. I'm going to close with this. Is there any other questions? Questions? Any other questions? Nope. Okay. I want to close with this and get y'all out of here. God is a God of an order. And there was a lot of things that had to take place when he created the heavens and the earth. One of the things that I learned scientifically that had to happen is what is called a continuum. That everything that happened when God created, everything had to happen at once. So when it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, those are three things that are separate within each other. The beginning, if there's a beginning, that means there has to be time. If, if there's a heaven, that means there has to be space. And if there's an earth, that means there has to be matter. If you look at beginning and heavens and earth, what you have is time, space, and matter, which scientifically is called a continuum. That means, in other words, it means all of those things had to come into existence at the exact same time because if you had time, what would, where would you put it if you didn't have space? If you had space, what would you put in it if you didn't have matter? But if you take and break down the time, the space, and the matter, you also have another trinity within a trinity because time is past, present, future. Space is length, width, and height, and matter is solid, liquid gas. Our God is an architect, and he's through and through. He doesn't make mistakes. And all that had to come into existence at the exact same time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word that came forth. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for the knowledge, Lord. Thank you for giving us the ability to read and study and comprehend your word. I pray, Lord, as we, we dig deeper into Genesis, Lord, that you continue to bring out these little nuggets of truth to help us help make it exciting and help us fall in love with your word all over again and help us to get into some good study habits. Father, and we love you and we praise you. And everybody said... Amen.